everyone. My name is Cindy Shu. I am a member on the uh, Elcor ALS Task Force and an assistant professor at, at the University of Michigan uh, in Emergency Medicine. And today it's my pleasure to be able to introduce and talk to Dr. Teresa Olesvikin from the Oslo University, who is the chair of Elcor's BOS Task Force. So welcome, Teresa. Thank you. I'm just going to jump right in, um, and, and this has been a long and interesting and arduous process, especially when we have COVID adding to the mix. And so I wanted to ask you to first discuss um, any new uh, uh, recommendations uh, uh, that the BLS task force put, is going to put forward for the start. So to be perfectly honest, uh, there are very few changes that I think are going to affect our everyday practice and, and how we do things. Um, and most of our recommendations and suggests, suggestions are based on common sense and, and sort of our limited understanding of, of how the body works. Very few uh, BLS treatment recommendations have the luxury of being based on high quality randomized controlled trials. Um, having said that, we have made some changes to the 2020 uh, consensus on science and treatment recommendations. And I think I'd like to mention three specific changes. So the first update you'll meet in the 2020 guidelines is on calling for help. Now, witnessing a cardiac arrest uh, with your mobile glued to your hand, I think is becoming more uh, likely than sort of having to run into another room and look for a phone that's plugged into the wall. So the, the implication of our uh, updated treatment recommendation is that we're actually essentially asking rescuers to train to multitask. We're now saying you should probably practice alerting EMS, activating the speaker or hands-free option on your phone while you're starting CPR. So I think you know that's one uh, one new issue that we've brought into the um, consensus on science. Uh, secondly, I think since the 2015 guidelines um, and treatment recommendations, we've also done several reviews within the emergency medical dispatch domain. Um, and we have a lot of observational studies that really underscores the importance of emergency medical dispatchers and the role in recognizing cardiac arrest and helping the caller um, get started with CPR. Um, one of these reviews, we found several studies that observed much higher survival rates among patients that received telephone assisted CPR compared to those that didn't receive any CPR. That's not very surprising, but I think what was really encouraging is that the outcomes for patients that received telephone assisted CPR were actually pretty comparable to those that were receiving CPR um, you know, from people that, that had been trained to do CPR. And I think that really um, you know, adding more science to support you know, the importance of emergency medical dispatch as a really integral part of our chain of survival. I think the third and last update I'd like to mention is our recommendation of uh, naloxone doing CPR for a suspected opioid overdose uh, with cardiac arrest. Now we looked at this question in, in 2015 as well. Um, then we did not identify any evidence for the, the use of naloxone in this specific setting and we therefore did not you know, give any recommendation. Five years later, we do the same review. We still haven't found any studies comparing outcomes for cardiac arrest patients with opioid overdose treated with standard CPR versus uh, naloxone addition to standard CPR. So basically where we were five years ago. And that left us with a choice, play it safe and say there is no evidence um, or look at what we do know and what we have and suggest some course of action based on so-called expert opinion and not hard evidence. And I think as a group, uh, I think we felt that providing some guidance on handling just a very small part of this very huge issue would be better than providing no guidance at all. That's, it's, that sounds very interesting. I think that what you mentioned about, you know, even just uh, bystanders having to deal with a cell phone issue. I think we've hear, all probably heard stories of people just hanging up on EMS or, you know, when they are calling up for how they couldn't figure out how to do CPR and talk to the dispatcher. So I think having... Uh, that incorporated within the BLS CoStar makes a perfect sense. Um, just kind of tie in with what you just mentioned about you know, several issues um, with the first question. What do you think are some of the major challenges that uh, BLS providers face today? 
So I think probably still the, the two main barriers to effective CPR is one, recognizing cardiac arrest, and two, knowing when to give bag mask ventilation or mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation. And these sound like pretty straightforward issues, but I don't think they are. Um, now, first, we've defined cardiac arrest as this condition where someone's unresponsive and not breathing normally. And it's a nice and simple operational definition, and it's geared towards giving us a very high sensitivity for recognizing cardiac arrest. So the last thing we want to do is not recognize cardiac arrest, because we know the only chance of survival is if someone actually starts CPR. So still deciding whether someone's breathing normally or not, it's, it can be tricky. Um, I know I certainly find it tricky sometimes. And how strange does it have to be to be, you know, abnormal? Um, and, and also, every unresponsive person not breathing normally is not actually in cardiac arrest. Seizures can look like cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest can look like seizures. So there's a lot of issues kind of complicating the, the diagnosis of cardiac arrest. And, and to me, I think this still remains one of our main challenges and barriers. Can you comment, I mean, now that essentially with the ongoing COVID pandemic, how, how has that introduced additional layer of complexity uh, to the BLS providers? Well, I think then, of course, tying into to sort of my second uh, barrier, I think it's really complicated the issue, or maybe simplified the issue, I guess some would think, uh, of, of um, ventilation. I think, I think we've never really been sure um, whether lay people can sort of reliably provide mouth-to-mouth uh, -mouth ventilation or, you know, how much training is actually needed to reliably provide bag mask ventilation. You know, it it's, looks like a simple skill and it's quite simple on a mannequin, but it's, you know, not simple at all in, in a real life setting. So I think, you know, we're, we're, we've been left with this uncertainty whether, uh, you know, we're actually doing it right. Uh, and we're also left with an uncertainty of when is it needed. And now with the added complexity of COVID and, and knowing that, you know, it's, it, it probably can't be done safely in any setting, in any patient group. Um, I think that's probably been a very strong driver for, for compression-only CPR in lay responders. And so to tie in with that, perhaps, uh, my next question is, uh, what do you think uh, were, what were some of the big controversies uh, that you guys encountered during the, uh, you know, the formation of BLS uh, CoStar process? Yeah, so I suspect everyone on the BLS task force would agree that the most painful discussion were on feedback devices. Uh -huh. um, we actually did identify some new evidence uh, we discussed for hours and hours and hours and, you know, ended up full circle right where we started and we haven't actually made any recommended changes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's an interesting problem or it's an interesting topic because it's, it's one of these things where a real time feedback device, it makes sense, right? You're measuring what you're doing. You're providing feedback to the provider. Uh, you would expect that then the CPR quality improves and that outcomes improve. And you know, a lot of studies have been done and we haven't really found any consistent evidence that it actually improves patient outcomes. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of begs the question, is it, you know, is it right to recommend or you know, should we be using our limited resources and funding uh, for this sometimes expensive technology when it doesn't really save any additional lives or when we don't really know that it does. I mean, that's not, that's not obvious that that would be the right thing to do. Right. On the other hand, it's just so, it, it, it is obvious that you really do need to measure what you're doing to, to be able to know that you're you know, delivering high quality healthcare. So we're kind of left at the point where we can't really say that it's important for the individual provider or the individual patient to be mm -hmm. treated with a feed feedback device, but it still makes sense for a system to want to measure what they're doing and, and look at their practice and, and do you know, everything they can to, to develop their, their um, healthcare system. Yeah, that makes sense. I think it's definitely a very challenging topic to study and implement. Um, uh, this actually ties in very nicely with my next question, uh, which uh, which are, has to do with really what what do you think are some of the most important knowledge gaps that you guys identified? So um, I think you know uh, addressing some of these issues that we've been talking about that we're sort of real still struggling with recognizing cardiac arrest. Um, 
I think you know some some important gaps related to new technology that we're seeing now. I think there's um, um, continuously sort of developed new personal monitoring equipment that has the ability to communicate with you know a dispatch or or alert that you're you know that you're unwell. Um, there's uh, video communication is becoming you know more and more common. Uh, there are dispatch uh, systems that are actually using artificial intelligence to try to improve the recognition of cardiac arrest. So I think, you know, a lot of, of um, new technology, perhaps in particular, that hopefully will will um, bridge some of those gaps that we have right now. Um, personally, I also like to see some attempt at uh, bridging the gap relating to, you know, what we know about ventilation and oxygenation and, and how important that is and, and when that becomes important during a resuscitation. Um, last question. So were there any lessons learned from this whole process? If you were to give yourself the advice for the next cycle of uh, updates, what would you tell yourself? Well, I think probably a lesson that um, perhaps we knew already, but um, you know, for ILCOR, having moved to a continuous process, um, you know, trying to to kind of keep up and have good systems uh, mm -hmm. to detect new evidence as it's emerging, I think it still kind of left us uh, <laughs> scrambling a bit with a lot of work to do at the last yeah. second. Yeah. So I think you know, it's it's one of the things I think that the BLS task force is is working on is trying to to get in place good systems so that we can you know. Uh, really truly do continuous evidence evaluation and have questions be more up to date and you know have our um, consensus on science on online be more up to date so that we're sort of continuously updating it with new science as that emerges. Well I'd like to thank you for your time today uh, Teresa and also for your hard work and the time that uh, your members uh, put in on this uh, really updating the co-star for the LS task force.